All right, welcome back to Enterprise Tuesday. My name is Matthew Grimes. Uh, I'm uh, one of the academic directors here at the Entrepreneurship Center, a reader in innovation and entrepreneurship here at the Judge Business School. Um, so the topic for this evening is the critically important raising finance to fund your vision with guest panelists, Carrie Baldwin of IQ Capital, Pam Garside of New Health, Simon Thorpe of Delta 2020, and Peter Cowley who is the president of the European Business Angel Network, chair of Cambridge Angels, and a fellow here with us. Um, in, you know, in my mind, one of the most challenging things that new entrepreneurs have to deal with is the, is the chicken or egg dilemma associated with raising finance. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you often need finance in order to build the, build the vision, uh, create market traction, that's not, you know, and then on the other, on the other hand, Investors are looking for you to demonstrate evidence of that market traction in order to in order to invest. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to um, hearing your thoughts on some of the some of the tensions associated with the early stage financing. A um, uh, couple quick uh, points of housekeeping: there's exits at the top and bottom of the stairs. In an event of an emergency, we'll be gathering at the front of the business school. Um, Please do turn off any mobile devices or laptops uh, that could distract um, your neighbors during this, during this time that we have here this evening. Um, one, one other point of feedback or, or uh, housekeeping. So um, I've been told also, uh, if you do have questions, please do save them for the Q&A period. The chair will call on you um, and we'll bring around the microphone just so that we are able to uh, capture your thoughts and your questions for the purposes of the filming. Um, before I turn things over to Peter and the panel, I, want, I do wanna highlight the next Venture Creation Weekend. So this is something that we run here at the Entrepreneurship Center. It's a fairly intensive two and a half day period. Uh, the next event is gonna be, is gonna be um, in March and there's a, uh, it's, it's focused specifically on, um, on innovation in food security. And so there is a discount available for those of you who uh, are able to sign up by the 24th of February. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, we have with us Soraya Thompson and uh, you, you can feel free to email her at this email address, speak with her in person or, or pick up a flyer um, outside in the foyer. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce the chair for tonight's event, uh, Peter Cowley. And, um, and then Peter, I'll let, uh, I'll let you do the honors of introducing Carrie, Pam, and Simon as well. Um, so Peter Cowley, he's a Cambridge University technology graduate. He's founded and run over a dozen businesses in technology and property over the last 35 plus years. He's built a portfolio of 67 different angel investments with five good exits and 10 failures, um, a, a, a great track record for early stage investing. He's the president of the European Business Angel Network, uh, chair of the Cambridge Business Angels, and was UK Angel of the Year in 2014 and 2015. He's, mentor, he's mentored hundreds of, of uh, founders and is on the board of nine different startups. He's one of our highly valued Cambridge Judge Entrepreneurship Fellows. He's a non-executive non director of the UK Business Angel Association and on the investment committee of the UK Angel Co-Fund. He's also sat on the boards of seven, dif seven different charities and he's published a variety of media including a book under the title of The Invested Investor. So please, uh, please join me in welcoming Peter uh, as our chair this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Is the mic working? I think it probably is working okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you. We've got almost a full house, which is great. Um, this, we've got about an hour and a half. We're going to finish at 8 o'clock or thereabouts. We're going to split it into two sections. The first half hour or so, we're going to talk and discuss things. And then from about 7 o'clock, we'll open up to the audience. Now, so as, as, was, as Matt, Matt said, we're going to le please leave the questions until then. Uh, also, when you ask questions, can you please make them as generic as possible for the, everybody else in the room? The last thing we want to do is for you to pitch to us, because we, I will cut you off if you do that. So make it a general question, bearing in mind there's a huge amount of experience here. If you do want to pitch to us, uh, if we don't run away, then we will um, we'll be downstairs later on. So three things, uh, two things just to check first. 
One, I just want, we want to understand who, what the audience is. So let's just work it out. Who is already on an entrepreneurial journey? I has founded a company. So there's probably about 12 of you. Um, who wants to be an entrepreneur at some point in the next year or two? Okay. Who is an investor? There's one there. Anybody else? And there's some here on the table. Okay. I wonder who the rest of you are. Uh, students, I guess. <laughs> so you haven't, or you're very shy, which is unlikely. So. M MBA students? Oh, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good. Thank you. So we've got a rough idea there. So just briefly before, uh, I'm not going to say much about myself. I will interfere probably with the answers at some point. I just want to point out this, this panel is excellent. There are Ignoring me, I said, uh, there, this is two-thirds women. I was on a panel, you can't see this here, in Turkey yesterday, where there are nine old blokes on it. Absolutely terrible, terrible. Um, I, I shouldn't even have been on that panel at all. Um, right, so we'll... I should have walked off, actually, yes. I, I, I did say, and in fact, the... The, um, the guy who runs it and owns the conference, the World Business and Angel Forum, was sitting next to me, and I, I accused him of picking the wrong panel. He smiled sweetly. Um, right, so we're going to introduce the three of them briefly, and each one, in turn, will give a few thoughts about um, the, our ecosystem, um, and then we'll, we'll do a few Q&A just to talk through the various um, things they've brought up and what you should do if you're... Actually, let's just ask another question. Who... I, I, who is going to raise funding, they think, in the next year? So, again, not that many of you, probably 12 or so. And I know, Jeremy, you've, you've raised funding. So have all the other... Who's raised funding already from angels, whatever? And who is running an entrepreneurial business that hasn't raised equity funding? Yeah, good. Good for you. Yeah, yeah, OK. So using customers to fund it. Excellent. OK. Right, so we'll just run through uh, very briefly. Kerry, I've known probably about eight or nine years. Uh, partner in IQ Capital here in Cambridge, VC, a very, very friendly VC. Not all VCs are friendly, as will be pointed out. <laughs> uh, Kerry will speak in a moment. Simon's a, a close friend, known for probably about eight or nine years as well, board of the Cambridge Angels, as, as Pam is as well. Uh, he's had more success than me. He invested in SwiftKey, for instance, which I missed out on, had a good exit there, and lots of other ones. Um, uh, but comes not from an entrepreneurial background, but comes from a city background, so it's somewhat different for me. And Pam, I don't know as well, though you're on, on my board, you've done angel investing, you're, but her particular skill set is healthcare. And of course, Cambridge is becoming to, com, becoming to be known much more strong on healthcare than we were, say, five or seven years ago. So let's open with Kerry. Kerry, you, the floor is yours for five or so, five, seven, eight minutes. Okay, so as you said, I'm a managing partner of IQ Capital. We are a venture capital firm. We invest at seed and we invest at Series A. Um, we, are, we have three funds and our latest fund we closed last year at 125 million and we're actively looking for investment. So this is very timely for a lot of you in the room. We're mainly focused on software um, and B2B. So that's my quick one on IQ Capital, but there's plenty of other time to catch up with me afterwards. So in terms of what we're here to discuss, I have two things, and they sound quite obvious. And the first one is do your homework before approaching a VC. So when you're looking for a partner with venture capital, you, it's as important as it is when you're choosing your founders. This is a marriage that will last for a long time. And if it's supportive and we are off to the right start, right from the beginning, you will gain so much more from our introductions. And when you just introduce me as friendly VC, we're a firm VC, don't get me wrong, but the word friendly, I would say, is trust and connection. And that's what we at IQ pride ourselves in. We have to connect with you. And this is what I would say to all of you in the room. When you go through your first funding uh, process, complete the process. Don't just take the first offer that lands on your desk and think, job done, move on. Complete the process. But more importantly, do your homework on the VCs you're approaching. Make sure they invest in your sector. Make sure you like the partners. Make sure there is that connection. Because if you don't have that connection, walk away. And I'll leave it at that for the moment so we can hear from the rest of the panellists. But there'll be plenty more, I'm sure, on those subjects. Good. OK, Kerry. Simon. So uh, thanks, Peter. So um, think of me as a business angel right at the beginning of, uh, of your journey. If, you're at the point where you're thinking, am I going to raise debt or am I going to raise equity? If you've made, already made the decision to raise equity, 
and you're not going to grow the business yourself, as I would say, organically, using your customers' money, you've decided you want to raise external capital, then the first place you'll go is you'll go to meet some angels like me or like Pam or like Peter before you go to the next stage, get to the serious money, which is Kerry and the venture capital money. So I generally invest in, uh, in what I call digital companies. I'm backing the digital revolution. My theory is very simply that uh, the economy is growing at 1% to 2% if you're lucky. The digital economy is growing at somewhere between 4 to 6%, so two or three times the pace of the underlying economy. And I'm essentially looking to invest in uh, technology or, or healthcare, life sciences companies that are growing much faster and employing some of the, the new technologies. So artificial intelligence, data security, these sorts of um, techniques, data analysis. You know, 90% of the world's data is created in the last two years. What are we going to do with all this data? We've got to be able to analyze it. So that's kind of me. Uh, lots of, uh, not as many companies invested in as Peter, but I've got a portfolio of about 30 investments. I've had plenty of successes. I've had plenty of failures. Uh, I've had plenty of experience of working with teams, small, big teams, um, many boards that are, are somewhat dysfunctional. I'd like to get them to be more functional. Uh, many boards that are not, not very diverse at all. Most of the boards I sit on are all male, um, and they're mostly, if you can believe it, guys that are even older than I am, um, which is not where we want to be, because that doesn't reflect our customers. Our customers are typically diverse, so you want your boards to be diverse. Um, so that's something maybe we want to talk about later. Probably the other thing I'm, I'm known for backing quite a few female-founded companies. Um, and um, with that, I think probably lots, lots I can say about finance. Obviously, my background is finance and accounting. I did a degree in finance and economics. I studied as a chartered accountant, found it very exciting, decided to do something else. Um, and I've eventually, essentially worked in, in the city analyzing companies all over the world for most of my career and been an angel investor for the last 10. So that's probably Good. about me for now. Thank you, Simon. And Pam. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also a fellow at the judge. I've been here a long time as a fellow in, in, in health, you know, in that whole uh, sector, as it were. So I'm what I think is of as an, uh, an accidental angel. So really I'm, a, I'm a management consultant, management advisor, and about 12 years ago, I got offered equity in a company instead of fees. I thought, ooh, exciting. And, and unfortunately, although fortunately, it sold very well, this company. I said, yay, great, this is what happens every time. Um, and then I started to get given equity, and then I would put some equity in. And now, quite often, I put equity in. I'm not talking a lot of money. I put in 10, 15, 20,000 pounds, and some, of, some colleagues may put in more. Uh, but then uh, I also get given equity at the same time, and they call me smart money. And I, all I do is health. I do the health sector. I do digital health. I, digital health. I don't do much of life sciences, although they're the bank at the moment. You know, they, you say, bank robber, why do you rob banks? It's where the money is. The banks at the moment are life sciences and data companies. So hopefully some of my companies will sell to them. But really, I'm in healthcare provision and data provision. Um, the things I would say that Peter's, I have uh, 13 companies, one sold and I have 13 companies, so I'm a baby compared to these guys. Um, we, s all of us see a lot of people. So I've seen one company today, two yesterday, two tomorrow. And the reason I don't do calls, and I hope my colleagues agree, is you have to meet people face to face because I believe that you have to get the uh, the lowdown on the founder and the feel for the founder or founders. Today I saw a company with no women on the website. In my world, over half of doctors in this country are women. Uh, way over half are women working in the health sector. And I just say, would you like to reflect on that? <laughs> uh, but I'll just support Simon and, what he, and uh, Peter said about, about women. But that's not the point. It's a, so we see a lot of people and we're looking for a chemistry and we're looking for a founder that can take this company, or it could be pivoting to another sort of company in a certain direction. The other thing I'd say, uh, chiming with Peter, is that we live in an ecosystem, and in my world, I'm a baby angel investor, but I know all the investors in health right up to the big guys, and we all talk to each other. And they'll ask me, what do you think of that one? You know, they'll know that I'm dealing at the front end with seed, with risky companies. So I work with a, um, a private equity VCT fund that's invested in three of the companies that I happen to have invested in. 
Um, I mean, it could be good judgment or coincidence. So you're always talking in an ecosystem. So be aware that everybody will be talking to each other if you're a, a hot prospect. Um, the other thing I'd say, this is so ridiculous, is don't have a daft business plan. Um, at our stage of investment, there's always slide nine that must be used. <laughs> so, and naturally you want that, but get ready to defend the logic behind your assumptions. I think that's what we want to see. We know there's a daft slide in there, but um, that's another thing. And I suppose finally, on the ecosystem, um, we also look at who your advisors are. I, I'm on advisory boards for companies I don't have equity in, uh, but uh, I, I choose very carefully about who I align myself with. And I think we as investors look to see who your advisors might be, what they've done. Because some of you will be young <coughs> and, and on your first venture. So uh, invest in getting some decent advisors as well. So that's my key point. Good. OK, thanks very much. Um, Two things really I want to mention. Uh, this is a bit of a plug for the book, which is, contains a lot of information about <coughs> finding angel investors and working with them. Simon's helped a lot with the book. Um, Max, in fact, did a podcast recently with one of the other partners of IQ, which will be out there. And I've just noticed my co-author is in the room as well, Kate, at the back there, so who's written a lot of books, including the big um, uh, Came Phenomenon books, which, which she was author of. So we're going to, I'm going to ask a question at the moment, but one thing I should just say that I think Simon does pretty well, I'm not sure if Pam does at all. On my own website, I've got a list of all the criteria. This is part of getting to know who to approach for funding. And one of those, those criteria is I won't invest more than 90 minutes by public transport from my home, which is here in Cambridge. And this is coming down to trust. And this is something that I, we often say, it took me about seven or eight years to work it out. It took me four years to work out not to invest in tech, to invest in people. It took me another three years or so to find that in the end, it's me as a person investing as the entrepreneur as a person. And that, so it's trust that's built up. And I, maybe I'm old here. I'm certainly probably one of the oldest in the room. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, Hugh disagrees with me. You have to know who it is. Hugh's been in VC for a very long time. If anybody knows Hugh. Um, and uh, building up trust, both pre investment and <coughs> helping post investment, is best done face to face, in my view. Um, so the, first, the question that probably matters most to those raising finance <coughs> is how to get at us, at the investors, and what have you got to do to attract us? So I'm just going to briefly ask, or let's, not, let's start with the VC after us. Let's start at this end, Pam. So this is, you know, they're trying to find us. They've got to put something to us. Yeah. And, and what is it that excites us to have that second conversation? Um, I, uh, so I mentor a lot of young people, and I have done for years, and half of them are doctors and half of the women, not the same half. Um, so, and, and they're very clever doctors. Probably, any doctors here, actually? Yeah? Are you still doctoring? Or have you left clinical medicine? Are you, you still doing it? Because um, I find they're lo leaving clinical medicine having this big crisis. You know, I've been in clinical medicine so long, I'm in the tribe, and I want to go and do something entrepreneurial. So I get a lot of people through those sorts of channels. And then uh, I have got to a point where I see people who are referred to me, because thanks probably to Peter, I was in the Sunday Times at the end of November, at, right at the back of the business section. A nice article on, on Angel, and I spent the next month on LinkedIn, you go, I don't really want to invest in your company. Because you, you do get a flood of people who really didn't get what I did. So um, I, I see people who I believe are credible who refer people to me, but that's still a lot, mm. still a lot. I also, I'm afraid uh, my shoulders go down when I see yet another physio app, let another, yet another doctor on your phone. I avoid wearables and wellness. I don't think people know that. Maybe I should have a website. Uh, the hot area of where genomics meets data, meets life sciences, meets uh, the new cancer treatments. I'm very interested in the data side of that. So if anybody has something in that area, and I saw one today from Cambridge actually on genomics uh, and data that had a patient-focused element, um, there are things that, uh, I've taken your point, I should tell people I'm interested in. I'll see them in, if they're in a hot area. Yeah. Good, thanks, Pam. Uh, so, Simon, yes. And actually, the reason you were in the Sunday Times was because I was in the Sunday Times, because it was Simon that was in the Sunday Times. <laughs> so Simon started all this. So. 
Yes, um, that, that's the value of networking. So I had a connection with the Sunday Times, and the Sunday Times asked me if I could find some other business angels well, that they your could. It's fault. Uh, it was all my fault, Pam. Uh, they specifically asked me if they could find uh, some angel investors that weren't white old men. Uh, and so that's why there were quite a few women interviewed subsequently, that including Pam. Head. But I see, I see probably last year I saw 600 plus pitches. So if you think about approaching me, then the first thing, going back to Kerry's point, is you've got to do your homework. So you can look at my website. In my case, it's Delta 2020. If you look at my website, it shows you all the companies I've invested in. So, and you can, and it tells you what my criteria are. And my criteria are, first of all, as Peter said, I'm investing in the team. The team is number one thing I'm investing in. If the team's not right, forget everything else. The second thing is I'm looking at what is the technology that I want to invest in? What is the idea that they have? And if you, if you come to me and say, well, I've looked at your website and one of your companies is doing so-and-so, I'm trying to do something I think is quite relevant to your company that's doing that. That might be a good introduction. Or I'm looking for a warm referral. So I'm looking for somebody that you might know who, who says, well, actually, Simon's probably a good investor for you because he's got that link that might be relevant. So there's some form of linkage. Um, cold introductions don't work very well. And then the third thing is I'm looking for, I'm looking for intellectual property. I'm looking for something that's defensible. I'm, I'm not looking, as Pam said, for yet another app. Um, and then the last thing, it has to be a big market, uh, preferably global. A lot of people come to me with great ideas, but it's such a tiny market that it's never really going to be interesting. It's not going to be interesting to an external investor. So, so those are some of the points yeah, good. that are absolutely key at the beginning. And so, Kerry, agree, disagree? I agree exactly. And I think, especially if you're based in Cambridge, you've got so much access to so many fantastic angels here who've built and sold some incredible companies. Make contact network, immerse yourself into the scene. And you don't just have to immerse yourself into the scene in Cambridge. There are other hubs of excellence. And you have to do this. And you have to meet other founders that are on the same path, the same stage as you, those that have gone be beyond you, and those that have done it and exited, and ask them what they did right. Look at the scale. Look at your business. What are you trying to do? If you want venture capital, you have to be able, we might want different things from our investments. So I am looking for dragons. So a dragon is a fund returner. So one investment that will return the fund. I don't necessarily want unicorns because I may only end up owning a small percentage of a unicorn. So I'm looking for dragons. So I'm looking for great companies that can pay back my fund, just like you are going to go through and fundraise every three to four years. I have to go out to market and fundraise, so I understand where you're at. So when you meet a venture capitalist, remember that they too, every four years, have to go out and raise funds. So you are the same, and we are entrepreneurial at heart. But I think it's that warm introduction that's very, very important. You are blessed. Have a look at your boards as well, um, uh, whilst you're going through that preparation of your deck phase. Um, and, but for me, it's looking at the VCs. Look at their portfolio. So before you come and have a meeting, or before you take a Zoom call, or whatever you're going to do, just before you have that meeting, look at my portfolio. Look at what I've invested in. Is it similar? Do you think I can add value to you? Do your homework. <coughs> Speak to other CEOs that I've invested in. See what they have to say about us as a fund. You know, and, and I think those are two elements. If I just left it there, if you do your homework, look at the portfolio and, and do research on us. You know, how do we behave? And that's really, really important for you as founders. Thank you very much. So before I ask a question about smart money and how important it is, I just want to give you a few stats. So these are approximate, they may be one or two years old. Each year in the UK, about 600,000 companies are formed, but a lot of those will be shelf companies or dormant companies. I think about 60,000 companies would like to raise finance, and I think it's about 6,000 that actually raise finance. So ignoring the 600,000 down to 60,000, let's take the 60,000. That means of every company that thinks or tries to raise finance, I'm talking about equity finance here, not debt or anything else, only one in 10 does it. So it's not easy. I mean, I, Simon, one that one number he gave 600. I, I, until I sort of switched off the incoming deals recently, I was getting 1,500 a year, and I invest in six or seven. That's one in every 200. The other thing to think about that, that you really will not 
understand until, unless you've been on an entrepreneurial journey, it's really difficult to scale a business. The number of businesses that actually scale, by scaling I mean getting up to tens of employees, maybe more. Now, you can exit a business. I mean, I had a, a business exit called Cambridge CMOS here in, in Cambridge, which was only about 30 people and exited for several tens of millions, but that was based on really strong IP portfolio. So of those 6,000 or so businesses that will raise investment, probably two or 300 will scale properly. So actually getting a business to actually turn into something big is really, really tough. And the other st statistic, which you probably know already, is of every 10 companies, this is an average, of course, that raise external funding, <coughs> seven or eight will probably go bust, or six or seven, or something like that. And then of the exits that happen, which will be a quarter or less, then you, some of these exits will be quite small. So-called acquihire, if you know that term, this is to acquire in order to hire a team. This will only be 10 million pounds, maybe 15 million pounds, 20 million pounds. And it, the biggies, you know, that more than 10x, which gives a good return, which is offsetting our losses, because we're, you know, we're not charities, we do actually would like our money back at some point, those may only be one out of out of every 10. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, let's throw some numbers around. Let's just talk about smart money. So this is the concept of when you get an investor, the investor helping or hindering, of course, we can talk about that as well. But let's start again, start at the far end and work our way back. Yes, so. so smart money, um, you know, VCs are strong at certain elements. We're great at, you know, every fund is different. But I, we at IQ Capital believe that angels are really smart if they've exited in that sector and they've built and scaled companies in that sector and we work very closely alongside you. And for us, that's really important in that seed scale, seed stage. Um, so we very much look for smart money alongside us as well. But smart money is making sure that you're really, before you take that scale, if I were to jump there, before you take that scale up, that you have, um, uh, most of the companies that fail are because they scale too early. Either your team's not in place, uh, you, you, you're, you haven't got your ICPs or your ideal customer profiles right, you don't have your market product fit or anything like that right. A lot of the companies scale too prematurely. That's a whole different panel, but we can talk about that. Um, yeah, I'd probably start with that, really. Good. OK. Simon. Yeah, so s smart for me is, means that uh, if you're, when you acquire an investor, you're getting an investor that's not just handing over money. They're actually handing over or able to hand over over a period of time a skill set which is relevant to your business. So if you're setting up a software business, it's quite a good idea that you've got investors who know something about software and who've previously invested in software businesses and might be able to help make introductions in the software industry uh, that would actually help you uh, win customers. So that, that's what I understand by, by smart money. Um, I, where it goes wrong, and I've seen this quite often, is where you have a completely disparate group of investors who've all got different objectives for the company's future. Um, and you have maybe five or six, and I've seen this recently in a company which uh, has, has essentially gone bust, because five or six different groups of investors had a totally different view of what the company's future would be, and they were all trying to impress on the company's founders their own view of what they thought was the future. Of course, none of them were right, um, and, and all they did was distract the, distract the founders from um, achieving a scale-up of, of the business. Bam. Yeah, the, I um, invested in a company in America this is before I knew about ER, EIS. You know, I was that dumb. Uh, it's actually doing very well, which is great. And they're the first people that said, you're smart money. I said, oh, okay. Um, so I help uh, with turbocharged contacts that are very, very valuable to them in the health system in America, but more here in, in the NHS and some of the big hospitals, hospital groups, private groups. Um, and I sit on two boards of companies I've invested in, which is quite a heavy-duty thing to do, I think. Um, but I also help most of the companies I've invested in, not all, I would say two-thirds I help a lot. So they'll say, do you know someone, and I do a quick intro, or they'll come to you for a judgment uh, on a strategy. Now, you get to know whether they listen or not. Um, but you can take them to task if they don't listen. So I think it's sort of strategy, judgment as a grown-up. Some of my companies are run by quite young people and, and the turbocharged uh, contacts. And that can also be to other investors. 
uh, I got an investor from New York into one of my favorite companies that is growing. What Peter says about scaling is so true. And the, the reverse of that in my world, which is very common in medical technology, is that companies limp along from pilot to pilot, from grant to grant, and you just say, kill it, kill it. But they're not, they're not growing at all, never mind scaling. But the scaling companies are uh, uh, unusual, but great fun to be involved in. Can I probably add one more point? Yeah, of course. Okay. So I'd, I'd add on a point, um, thinking about your exit, where you want to go to. So when you're talking about smart money, you're also saying, what do you want to do with your company? What is your end goal? Does that VC agree with your end goal? Can that VC take you there? How many rounds beyond this VC am I going to need? And then you start to get into the joys of vintages of funds, which we can go into. So when we talk about some of the things that do work that we see, one of the things that you can see which doesn't work is when, uh, let's say, I make an investment out of a 2018 fund, and I've got all that time, because VCs generally have a 10-year fund where you invest for five years and divest for five years, yeah? And then let's say you take investment from a tail end of a fund, they're going to have different agendas. They might push you to exit a little bit faster than you want. You may need greater time. So at our fund, you know, the companies that we've sold, you know, we sold to Google, we sold to Apple, we sold to Oracle. We had some great exits, but we made sure that the investors we're co-investing alongside have the same idea, or you try and hope that you have the same timescales that matches you. Remember, you are the important one here. You're the founder, and it has to match where we're going. And make sure that those companies, one of the things we have to do as venture, capitali cam venture capitalists sorry, is, is stay really in touch with those buyers. So we're very close to all of the M&A houses. What is Oracle buying at the moment? What are the problems here? We're specking out that market the whole time. And then we're seeing you coming in saying, I want to do this. We know these guys want this. But it's make sure we also address um, the exit. Yeah, OK. Right, I'm going to open up to questions about five or six minutes. But first of all, I'd, I'm going to ask a question. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, sorry, I'll give them a bit of time. So I'm going to get each of you to say something about the things you don't think we've covered in the last half hour. So I'll give, but while you're thinking about that, uh, a couple of things I want to say. One is the importance of customer money. Now, two things really important here. One, if you get money from customers, it proves product market fit. Because in the end, a business that either has to rely on equity, that's us writing a check to you because you're not making enough money, or it relies on customers. Cu product market fit is the fact you've got a product or service that the market wants and is willing to pay enough for it, you're actually making enough margin in order to run the business. So if you can get that, then you, A, you're proving you've got a business, which will make it easy to raise more money. And secondly, you're not diluting your own company. So that, you know, so you're not ending up with a situation where when you do sell it, if you get to that point, you don't have to give some money to us. So if you get that product market bit, very important. The other thing I just want, briefly want to say is what the Cambridge community wants. So first, a question, how many are you, of you are not <coughs> based in Cambridge? Not many at all. Okay, so I'll just give. So Cam the Cambridge community is very. It's, it's quite small. It's, you know, the, the city itself is 150,000 people. It's super well connected, as was mentioned earlier on. And so, in fact, if you find you can't get money in the Cambridge community, we'll all talk to each other, and you won't be able to get money if you're not careful. <laughs> but what we do do is we do the sort of thing you'd expect here in a, at a scientific university, primarily scientific. I know there's lots of other faculties as well, which is technology. And usually, um, no, sorry, always product-based. We don't really do service investment. And we generally do B2B. Um, the, hardly any B2C in Cambridge. So if you've got a B2C business, um, then you will struggle from the general sources of funding here in Cambridge to get that. So having given them a bit of time to talk, this time we'll start with Simon. Okay, a couple of things to say. Uh, so innovation is obviously really important. Cambridge happens to be the most innovative city in the UK by far. Twi twice the number of patents in, developed in Cambridge than any other city. So you're in the right place. If you can't raise finance here, you need to ask why. Now it could be because, uh, as Peter said earlier, if you're running a fintech business, then Cambridge isn't the obvious place to go. There are some fintech businesses here, but London is the obvious place because it's a financial centre. So you need to think about the the right place. But if you're technology and life sciences, this is a pretty good place. Um, one other thing to say around potential funding sources, 
is think about Innovate UK. It offers grants, it offers loans. In the Swift Key case, they had a grant for I think 25 or 50,000 pounds very early on. That meant they had to give away less equity early on. And that meant when they came to an exit, uh, the, the two founders' original stakes were much bigger than they otherwise would have been. So that's something to think about. And the loan facility, which at least I'm aware of, at least one Cambridge company who somebody in this room would know, who's just doing an innovation loan, uh, grant, uh, Innovation UK loan uh, at three point something percent uh, interest, uh, very attractive for the right company. So bear in mind those things. There's R&D tax credits, there's patent box, there's lots of other things that the UK is very keen to help companies with to encourage entrepreneurship. There's lots of in incubators and accelerators here in Cambridge as well as elsewhere. So there's plenty of infrastructure to support you, plenty of people wishing to see entrepreneurs succeed. Good, thank you. Pam, then Kerry. So Pam? Uh, yeah, one thing that my colleagues on the panel will know more about is you're always raising money. Whatever you're doing, you're, you're either if you're communicating regularly with the community of investors, which you should be, you always seem to be in raising money modes. And one thing that I am not the person to ask is how much money to raise when. But people seem to get this a bit wrong. They don't raise enough. They spend a lot of founder time in the next 12 months raising the next round. I'd like to hear other views on this. But you're always raising money has two sides. One is it's good. You know, and you're always communicating with who you're raising money for, who you might sell to. But equally, it absorbs a massive amount of time. Um, uh, oh, another, another thing that I've found is absolutely a magic and an art, not a science, is valuation. Um, I invested in a company, it's the one I was just about to tell you about, where a year in I was thinking, what have I done? And it just raised a huge amount of money for a small startup from Atomico. And, uh, and I'm just like, oh. WTF, that's good then. <laughs> uh, actually, it might not be to their advantage. It's so uh, highly valued. But valuation, we could talk about, but it's, it's not a science. The, the final thing I'd say is um, get good advisors. Um, in, in law firms, you don't have to go to the big ones. Some of the big ones do offer help to uh, um, companies. I'm based in London, by the way. I'm not in Cambridge either. Um, but I went through a journey with one of my investee companies that... Um, we stopped, and I say we because I helped, and we got rid of a couple of the investors and the advisors. It was a legal uh, firm. It was very, very difficult. If you have any suspicion or don't trust them or don't like them, get rid of them. Same with an employee. Don't hang around. Get rid of them. So that's my other one. That's very draconian, actually, that. But uh, yes, <coughs> they do say hire slowly, fire fast. Yeah. Really difficult to do. Yeah, um, really Ke difficult. Yeah, Kerry? Yeah, for me, we look for thought leaders, so we're investing very early, so you may not have all the answers. So this comes down to what is that first meeting with a seed and Series A fund like? So with us, we like to have a conversation. So for our seed investments, it's very much your deck has to be relevant, get my attention, you have to understand all the elements from the market where you're going, everything like that has to be in there, very clear. But for me, it's the conversation that we're having. We're looking for thought leaders. So we're looking for people that are exceptional in their field, which probably means that you will need other people alongside you at some time. You might need people to commercialize for you if you're a deep tech founder. You might need people, other people brought on board alongside you. And you're looking for someone that can help with that. In terms of timing for approaching funds, we think when you're not fundraising, I think we probably all agree, is a great time to start approaching, especially VCs. You want to have as much time to run that process. And as I said, run that process right to the end. Don't just take the first money on the table. And, and I reiterate again when I started, which is do your homework. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. If you know they've never invested in that space, or they cannot help you and they can't guide you to exit, just don't waste your time. You'd be amazed how many people do waste their time just having a meeting. And, you know, it, it's not in your interest. So. Good, excellent. Right, so there's a couple of roving mics here. So just a few rules. One, uh, please wait for the mic because this is being recorded and uh, streamed. Secondly, please don't be interactive unless we ask a question of you again assume you haven't passed the mic away so it's just a question 
okay. to us. Thirdly, uh, if you want to address somebody in the panel for the question, fine, we'll do that. Otherwise, I'll decide who's the best person or people to talk to. So we've got about 45 minutes or so. We have a question there at the back. Um, microphone will head your direction. And as, as I said earlier on, please make it as generic, if at all possible. No, there's a guy at the back first, yeah. And then the guy further for, forward. <coughs> Can you say who you are as well? Yes, a good idea. Sorry? Can who you are you? Who you are? Oh, I'm Grigory doing physics fourth year. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm wondering how do you determine the valuation of a company, especially in the early stages? Thank okay. you. Yeah, fine. Great question. And um, I will get each member of the panel to answer that because it's a really important question for everybody. So we're going to no, we're going to start with Simon first. Okay. No, Kerry can be at the end because she's maybe a different view. Simon. Um, well, back in 2009, I had a rule of thumb which was twice forward turnover. Um, but things have changed. Companies are a lot more expensive than that now. Um, and uh, to Pam's point earlier, it, it, it's, it's an art, not a science. But there are certain rules I have in my head. But ultimately, the price gets set by supply and demand. That's, that's how it gets set. There are certain uh, data, data points. There are certain benchmarks. Um, you know, we, know, we know typically what we're paying for companies at a certain level. So you know, typically, startups that maybe have... Uh, maybe come straight out of a, of a top accelerator in London. At the moment, they might come out at a sort of three, four million pound valuation. Uh, you know, we don't we don't really like that because we think that's the wrong price. Uh, but that that's that's where they're coming out. There are there are rounds that are done by venture capitalists in companies at 15 and 20 million pounds. I've, I've invested in some companies that are valued at that number alongside a, a venture capitalist. Obviously, I'm not driving the valuation; the venture capitalist is. <laughs> If I think it's got a really good team, a really good tech, and all the things I mentioned earlier, I might well invest at 15 or 20 million pounds. Sounds an incredibly high price, but if I genuinely believe in the story, then, then, I'll, then I'll, I'll go with it. Yeah, Pam? Uh, I've already, I've already uh, okay. said my bit, but hang on. Because there are, there are obviously benchmarks in certain um, uh, subsectors, even within health and life sciences. And, and then somebody blows it out of the water. And the one in my world was Roche buying Flatiron for $2.1 billion because of the structured data that this company held. It was crazy. But uh, talking about valuation at the beginning, I'll let my colleagues say it, it's, uh, it, it's if there's a bidding war, there's, there are no rules. If there are several people, and, and not just at Exit, which obviously was for Flatiron, but there was a bidding war between VCs, which happened in the case I was talking about then it inflates it. Um, I'll let others talk about the seed valuation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Kerry. So in my experience, and it changes all the time, obviously I started in 98, so I've seen quite a few cycles and, and stuff. So most companies of recent years, let's forget the, the 90s and that, most companies of recent years have been raising at that very early round enough money to get through 12 months. Yeah, that's to optimise your valuation. Now, I think all of us may have different views, but if we are coming into choppy waters, let's say, and, and, and we, we might want to be considering raising a little bit more money. Now, that does mean that it, you are going to give away a little bit more, but that comes back to that right investor. And it's better to have this percentage of a company that has a chance of doing that than a larger percentage of an investor that won't give value. All the points of these that everyone's discussed today. When we're talking about metrics, when we're looking for Series A, for example, we're saying they've got to have a million ARR and all of this, but we all twist it at times if we love the team and the market's so unique and they're doing all this lovely stuff and the, we can see the scale. But we as venture capitals, I can't say that word today. We as venture capitals, VCs. VCs. VCs, yeah. We as VCs, um, we, we as VCs ha have to remain focused. You know, how much money are you going to need over time? And you need to ascertain. A lot of people just think about that first initial round. I'm up and running and pressure down. Hard work now, but pressure down. You've got to think about the next round. And the most important thing you're doing when you're raising money, and I'm not trying to dodge your valuation question. What I'm saying is make sure you're raising enough money. Um, what, what you're trying to do is raise enough money to prove something. And then you think about valuations. You're saying, if I'm raising, let's say, 1.5 million, it is to demonstrate this, either that I could have gone beyond POC and I'm now on proper rollouts, 
or I, I, I need it for X, Y, and Z, or to build this, but you have to be able to prove what you're raising and then set your valuation from what you're going to be able to evidence because that's how I'm setting your valuation. When you get further down the road and you're on to sort of Series A and things like this, you start getting into metrics such as eight times gross uh, margin, for example. That's on a good year. You know, that's on a good company. We're looking for companies that are growing sort of 3x at that rate and you can start really motoring and getting some big valuations we are in at the moment, I would say, and I'm sure you probably agree, we're seeing a lot of high valuations. But this comes right back to that point, which is the right investor alongside us. So at IQ Capital, we're deep tech. We've always been in deep tech. We've remained a deep tech venture capitalist. Therefore, people want to work with us and want to uh, you know, carry out their sort of plans with us. And that means that we're winning term sheets on much lower valuations than other funds are putting in. So it's not about, you say, you get into a term sheet war. The last three deals that we've conducted, we were the lowest on valuation. But that founder said, I want to work with these guys. Why? And it comes back to everything we've discussed today. Good. Thank you very much. We move the, the microphone down there. Just before, can you move the microphone to this chap and then down here? Just briefly, you usually will be selling about 25% of your company, 20 to 30%. So if you need one and a half million, that means having a valuation of three and a half, four million. That, that's a number that, as angels, we would not invest at. That's definitely a VC territory. This, yep. Uh, hi, I'm Viz. I'm with the MBA at uh, Just Business School. My question is targeted to Kerry. Uh, with regards to your portfolio, you have companies that are in uh, cloud computing to uh, AI to life sciences or healthcare. So how do you manage the, I mean, like, I mean, how do you manage exposure of your fund towards various industries? And like, I understand there are advisors, but then how do you, handhold the companies or in the next stages, et cetera? OK, that's a great question. So again, you're directing at me. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. So you're, we are looking for thought leaders. So as I said earlier, we're looking for thought leaders in that space. Uh, then alongside that, we also work with the fantastic Cambridge Network, Cambridge Angels, of course, and all of these fantastic guys around here that are experts in that vertical. So a lot of our DD, we've also be able to, when we go into an investment, we're able to do some wonderful DD based on where we are, you know, and we're able to bring advisors along board. But we are looking, most of these companies will go through the same type of problems. It'll be team, it'll be augmenting uh, commercial, it'll be making sure you've set your product market fit. Everything is pretty much the same, even though we've got different, different sectors here. And because we've been in deep tech and guiding these companies right through to exit, you're aware of all these problems. So in terms of our focus, our analysts are experts at, from particle physics to, to sort of to, to, to the quantum computing and all these different things. So we can actually analyze really well what's going on, but you always need to draw in those experts from around. We don't know it all. Good, OK. Um, shall we move on to another question? Uh, DD is due diligence. Uh, down here first, and then the lady up there. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> as a um, an angel or, the, or early stage VC, um, how involved do you expect to be, or do you like to be, in uh, in your investments? Uh, so, I mean, for example, uh, key management, you know, very important management decisions like, uh, to, you know, uh, like um, finding co-founders, for example. Uh, do you do you want to do that, or, or, uh, or do you? Uh, I mean, do you avoid people who um, who don't want your uh, your input on that, or do you or do you actually prefer people who who want? To, uh, who wants you to actually be involved? Yeah. With so who? Team. So you, who are you? Uh, what's well, I, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> I, I like to hear all of them. But, uh, it's very. So this guy's looking for yeah. a co-founder, I think. So. <laughs> well, no, no. I've got, I've got one on my You've left and one on my right. Yeah. But, okay, um, but it's. Uh, yeah. I've got but other questions. Yeah. As well, I'll pass this to Simon first in a minute. But having coming to us without your co-founders is not really going to work. We we not we won't find the co-founders for you. I'm offering having this conversation with somebody who knows they need to be a team of two because it's very difficult for to invest in a single founder and doesn't know who they who to find that. And when they do find somebody, it's then dividing the pie up in a way that's not the obvious 50-50 because they don't want to do that because they put effort in already. So, no, please do build up a team and a team that looks cohesive before you come to us. Is that you three? Uh, yes. Good, yeah, excellent. Simon, do you want to say something about 
involvement in business? Yes, yeah, so, so this is a really good question. So, so most Cambridge Angels would regard themselves as being very active investors. I actually started off as a very passive investor. Uh, and actually, many of my biggest successes have been because I've been a passive investor. <laughs> okay. Now, that is because I haven't interfered with those businesses. But actually, joking apart, it's because I was confident that the board of the company were able to help the company. The right decisions were being made because the company had a decent board. And there was an angel who was representing the group of angels on the board. So this is happening all the time. If you think I've got a portfolio of 30 companies, I'm not going to be on the board of 30 companies. Otherwise, I'd only be sitting in board meetings all day, and that wouldn't be very helpful for the company. It would certainly be pretty boring for me. I'm on the board of five companies. Five companies is, is enough, frankly. Um, so in the other 25 companies that I'm not on the board of, I am relying on somebody that I trust who probably almost certainly knows much more about the technology in that particular company and knows the team better than I do. And I'm relying on them. And then sometimes they'll be relying on me when I'm on the board. So we're helping each other. So we'll have something from Pam and then we move to the next question. Yeah, I think it, it, it does depend a bit whether you're on the board. Um, I, I, I'm on the board of, of one at the moment that's run by three doctors. Now, um, I, I'll politely say doctors are usually top of the class and can do everything. They sometimes don't make the best founders. I shouldn't, yeah, I'm being filmed, aren't I? Um, <laughs> these are such smart people. The great thing is they know what they don't know. So I'm helping them hire people. I mean, I'm not HR, but I've found people I'm helping put together a very senior advisory board. Um, you wouldn't hire me for my financial knowledge. Uh, but uh, they, they do contact me a lot. But I am also paid as a board member, as well as sitting on, on the board, uh, as well as, sorry, having put some equity in. And I've got other companies where um, I, I get a very small stipend, so I'm just there at the end of a phone. And I'm quite responsive, so I get used quite a lot. But it's those things I said before, it's sort of, judgment sometimes people and mostly contacts so yeah okay Ke Kerry's actually wants to say something I, I do want to say something which is really relevant because I hear from so many founders that come to me oh I went to this VC and they promised this they promised this and they're going to do this for me and they're going to introduce me to this and they're going to introduce me to this it doesn't always happen that way so which is why you have to do your research a lot of people will just promise you the world and they'll do this introduction and that they don't so do your research on the company. In terms of how active a VC is with you, it would be make sure you've got the right person at that VC on your board and make sure they're helping you with the right things that you need help with. So for example, we would help with your positioning, your messaging as you're taking that product out. We would help you when you're augmenting your team with the commercials, maybe when you're hiring a chairman from our network, we'd introduce you to the right chairman. We would certainly guide you through your funding round and your next funding round, taking on the valuation, the quantum. But, but when people promise you the world, make sure you do your homework. Good. OK. The woman at the back. Thank you. Um, my name's Amanda Nunn. I'm the CEO of a startup SaaS business in Cambridge. You've all talked about the importance of chemistry and the team when you're looking to make investments. I wondered if any of you could articulate that a bit further. That's really difficult. Well, really difficult. Okay, Sam. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a first-hand example. So a female entrepreneur came to meet me yesterday. She, she'd had a call with me previously, and there was enough in the call to, for me to suggest, why don't you come and meet me? And we'll, we'll talk through this in a bit more detail. So we did. She came to meet me yesterday. And within 10 or 15 minutes, I had a pretty good idea of the sort of person she was. And I decided that she wasn't investable. Now, why did I decide she wasn't investable? Because she wouldn't listen. <laughs> that was the first thing. That was the most important thing. And I, ha I had two, two of my colleagues in the room. And we had a debrief afterwards. And um, one of my colleagues, who's female, she came out and she said, wow, I'm exhausted, that woman just couldn't stop talking. And, that, and that's what she said to me, that was her first bit of feedback. And I said, well, what you mean is she's not actually listening. So that was, that was the first thing. The second thing was, she, she's a single founder. She actually has already built a business. And I was saying to her, why do you want to get external funding? Because if you get external funding, you've got to build a team. Why not actually just be a sole trader and develop the business, use your existing customers? But she couldn't really get her head around that. And I was saying to her, if, if she was going to build a business with external funding, she'd need a CTO, um, because she was the commercial person. 
but she, she just wasn't really taking that on board. So that's, that's an example of, of, of chemistry. I knew that the chemistry wasn't right almost straight away. So everybody's going to answer this. So Kerry, next. OK, so I think it's a really, really good question. Um, and I would say uh, it, it happens at the first meeting. So I tend not to follow through your deck. I tend to sort of have a conversation. I want to find your passion. Why are you doing this? What brought you to this table? Why are we here? And, and that has to come through. And sometimes it's masked when you're giving a pitch perfect deck. And these are the five messages I've got to deliver on this slide. And <laughs> I got those in. And it's have a conversation, show your vulnerabilities. I know this, but I don't know this, or I need help with this. As soon as you start to get onto that stage, that's when that connection happens, especially in that early stage where you're saying, I, I don't quite know how to do this element. And as soon as you get to that point with the VC, you're. It happens, and it's quite magical when it happens. So I say, for, for me at Seed, show an element of vulnerability, like I don't have it all figured out. That's why I'm here. Mm. Um. Oof, this is a good one, because um, I like to think I have good judgment in people, you know, people who say that often. Do they really? Um, and so my husband says, oh, God, another one sucked you in. So I, <laughs> I, I like really bright, funny people. I mean, that's really bad, isn't it? Funny. Sense of humour, that will make you a lot of money. Um, but they have to be really bright, technically comp competent, know their field, work their behind off. I have a co-investor in one, and I said, oh, that founder is working so hard. Does he get any sleep? He said, I don't care. He's just going to be working. So you can tell, you can tell who's going to work 23-7 passion. I think you can get a feeling for that. I also then um, send them to see other people and get close friends in, in the industry, may, maybe investors, you know, colleagues, and, and get a feel for them. And um, I wrote something else. Oh, yeah, th there's the reverse of that. Because um, I may not be super financially com competent, but I know a lot of people uh, occasionally people have come and drop names about who they know and I go, no, you don't, you know, I'm thinking to myself. So there's, I do not like the show-off factor of, uh, and it's just a gut, th it, it is very much a gut thing that has worked for me, but it's also a gut on hiring. We, we haven't talked about chairs yet, about other people on the board as well, and it goes to that as well about um, a gut as well as their track record and obviously a demonstration of competence. I think there has to be a chemistry. Now, this is difficult when you get you know, a lot of people and the founders, etc., with boards, but a lot of it's gut. Yeah, which then leads me to say that um, it's difficult for us as well, because if we had been talking to some founders for a little while, you know, maybe had a couple of meetings and we decided they're not investable, how on earth do we put that across to another human being without upsetting them? So mm -hmm. we end up saying things that aren't really what we should be saying like the market's not big enough or something which or, or you know whatever something that's just sort of weasel words because we don't we can't easily say to them you're not investable you know i mean obviously we're not investing them we also mustn't prick the balloon of the entrepreneur because there will be there almost certainly will be somebody out there not always of course because i said it's a 10 to 1 that gets investment but there will po possibly be somebody who'll invest in them so that conversation is really difficult for us as well there's so there's one more thing that it may not be answer your question, but don't be desperate. Some people come, I don't know whether others find this, and there's this air of desperation. You know, they've got six weeks less of cash, and, and you feel like saying, don't exude desperation through your pores. You know, other people bluff it and go, oh, we've got a bidding war. That's a much better approach, having said I don't like show offs, but <laughs> <laughs> don't be desperate. Yes, yeah, so, so Jeremy, do you want to say something? And then this chap down here. Sorry, my name's uh, Jeremy. I'm uh, running a fintech um, software company in Cambridge. We, we are recruiting software developers. That was my <laughs> um, question for the, the whole panel. Very, very helpful, actually. Um, do you think your profession, and it, it is a difficult one, by the way, Peter, you've given some numbers, you know, returns, so it's, it's a difficult profession. Do you think your profession is getting more difficult with time? And if so, how are you sort of bulletproofing yourself? So how are you sort of... Uh, managing to keep up, assuming you are thinking it is getting well, better. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's, a it's not a profession as such, <laughs> is it? I, I, I take it as a hobby. 
because in the end I'm giving any entrepreneur some money and I don't expect it back again. The chance of me getting it back isn't very high. And in fact, if I do get some of it back, even if it's only 10 or 15%, I'm really positive because I've got no chance otherwise. So I do it and I suspect every on the panel does it. It's slightly less for Kerry because she's responsible for somebody else's money. We do it because we enjoy it. We enjoy spending time with people in the audience. We enjoy spending, you know, who are generally younger than us, almost or certainly younger than me. And it's, it's just good fun. It's, it's so the, um, is it getting more difficult? Probably not. If anything, it's getting easier. I mean, we're all getting a little bit more cynical as we've seen more and more of these things fail, etc. Anyway, I'll, that's all I'll say now. <laughs> who else wants to? Um, I'll have to take. Kerry first? Yeah. Or, or you? Well, Kerry's going to have a different view because she's a VC. So, but, but if, from an angel perspective, like, I have a slightly different view from Peter. So, so I view it more as a business, but, but I do it for the similar reasons. I enjoy doing it. It's fun. I like working with young people. I like discovering new technologies and helping companies to grow, helping those people to grow, building businesses, creating jobs. So that's why I do it. <laughs> um, but I do expect to see a return. So, and I do expect lots of my companies to go bust, as Peter said, you know, out of every 10, I'm probably expecting seven to go bust, three to do well, one to do really well. I need one to do really, really well. That will pay for all the others. Um, the problem ones, the problem childs, are the ones that are on their eighth round. Yeah. And that I've been investing every year for eight years. And I've got two of those. And both companies are actually doing quite well. There's nothing, there's nothing that says to me that company's gonna fail. They're still doing everything they said they would do. It's just taking them a lot longer. The management team's been exactly the same. I still have faith in the management team. So, you know, so I'm going to keep going. But that, those are difficult. But if I'm doing really well, I'm hoping that my companies are going to, get, are going to be interested, uh, interesting enough for Kerry to come along and say, Simon, that company looks really interesting. I, need to, I want to see them. Not all my companies will be of interest to Kerry, but some should be. And likewise, I'm looking at yours saying, what are you guys investing in? Because I want to, it's, it's a like for like, so it's not all. So from my point of view, and a great question, by the way. Um, from my point of view, how are we managing to keep up as our profession is changing? So for us, how, how we ran it in the 90s and how we run it now are completely different. So for IQ Capital, our fund size has to increase because all of the funding rounds have increased. So our fund back in early 2000 was 25 million, then it's 50 million, now it's 125 million. We've kept our focus, as I've said, we've kept in deep tech in that phase. You know, other funds will come in, they'll dip into deep tech, and then as soon as it gets a little tricky, they'll run away straight away. So, so be careful of that, you know, how long have these teams been investing in, in deep tech, if that's your thing. Um, so for me, it has become easier in certain ways because we now have more data points. So when I look at a company, there's so much data now that I didn't have back in the 90s. You know, it really was those founders and, yeah, we're going to do this. Okay, right. But nowadays, you know, with all the data that you're collecting and the metrics we can see all the way through, um, we're able to have more data points, making those decisions earlier in the life cycle than we were earlier. And I say it's also all of these companies are faster to market. You've got the cloud, all these things that weren't there in the olden days. You know, you can actually scale a team, you can attract awesome founders fast as you're so connected in your communities. Right from this building, you are connected. You know, we, we didn't have this in the late 90s. You didn't have fantastic institutions like the church. It just, just wasn't there with all that vibrant innovation, all these awesome courses they put on for you. Good, thank you. Pam? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Simon said about young people, tech, being involved, helping. And we all like that sort of thing. Um, talking to my American colleagues, they can't believe the tax breaks we get here. We mustn't forget the amazing ta tax breaks with EIS and SEIS, which the government has continued to support and has moved to even more risky regs, you know, encouraging uh, VCTs and people like us, to uh, venture, venture capital trusts in particular, to go into more risky, less asset based. So that's a consolation when you hear um, the statistics from Peter and Simon. I mean, we must be mad, really, mustn't we, for the return potential. Mine is all still going. I've got a couple of like yours. But, um, no, they'll, they'll come. But yeah, exactly. Peter, they'll Peter, die. Peter <laughs> answer this finally, because the guy I met before, long story, um, in, who's Cambridge-based, said, you shouldn't be, he was saying, don't, shouldn't be an angel investor. I said, well, it's a bit late. 
Um, but, you know, it's such a mugs game. What do you say to that? No, it's not at all. I mean, I, I drifted into it. I'm also an accidental angel investor, and I've just embraced it solidly. And I, I've put an awful lot of capital, family capital into this. And uh, I have got a big portfolio. There's lots of, I mean, the statist statistically, I should do okay out of it. Yeah. Um, but it wouldn't matter. I mean, if, usually I'll say on stage, if I get all my money back plus one euro, one pound, I'll be happy. Yeah. And there's a reasonably good chance of doing that. And, uh, you know, in terms of Simon's view as a business, he'll want a risk adjusted return per year out of it, which is probably 10%. It's said that we can get as much as 20, 25% if you, over time, but of course, you need an awful lot of luck in there. You need you, you know, Google DeepMind, or you need something. You don't need anything as big as that. So no, I, I really do it because I'm at the back end of my career, inverted commas, and I'm taking a lot of risk. And I just do it because I absolutely love it. Yeah. Shall we move on to another question? Chap there. Good evening. Hi. So my name's Will. I'm a doctor, a postgrad student here, and soon to be a founder. Mm -hmm. My question's really sparked by some of the things that you've described, Pam, where somebody has a profession that deeply informs the company that they want to found. How do you balance the continuation of that profession with what obviously as an investor you require of the complete time dedication yeah. in the new business? So, so are, you, are you still doctoring? Are you still seeing patients? Or? Uh, this, this year I'm studying a master's degree, but I plan on going back because that very much informs the business that I want to build. Yeah, it's a good one, because the company I mentioned that uh, was founded by one doctor in particular, but three of them, uh, he is, uh, is still, he's a consultant gastroenterologist as well as running this company. I don't know when this guy sleeps, and that worried me at first, because you have to be completely dedicated to build these things. Uh, but th these are the guys that listen. I think you can do it. I think investors do say at some point, well, how is, that, how is what you do in the rest of your time benefiting the company? In this case, it kind of does. It, it's a credibility thing, but you, pro you know, that you still see patients is a badge of honor in my world that you still see patients. And Americans are more on that scale than we are. Um, I think if you have hard-nosed investors that go, I want your time, I want you to give up that clinical load, I can imagine that happening. It depends, it depends what it is that you're doing. But are you going to be the CEO of this thing? Uh, certainly in initial stages. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the person. Um, but it happens in other professions as well. I've got, there's a dental company that's um, approached me recently. Very, very interesting proposition, but that dentist has actually given up. <laughs> I don't know why anyone's given up dentistry. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it depends, and it depends on the rest of your team as well. Can we just move this offline, actually, and you two talk? Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's not Sorry. that relevant to everybody else. There's a guy who's already asked a question first, but I'm going to start with here. Sorry, you've already asked one, so, uh, yes? Gentlemen there? I Hello. will come back to you if nobody else does. So. Uh, my name is Alexandros. I'm also in the MBA program here at Judge Business School. I would like to ask you, like in the companies that you target, um, in terms of uh, costs, do you prefer companies that would have, for example, low fixed costs and high marginal costs over time, or the opposite? I mean, would you invest in a company that would have high fixed costs over a long period of time? and low marginal costs, like what is the, the target companies on that side? And also, in terms of uh, platforms that have become so popular these days, and they seem to attract a lot of investment, do you value platforms more than some other uh, products or, uh, that are out there? Thank you. There was a slide actually up in Turkey yesterday which said that the multiple on ARR for platforms was something like double the next stage down. So, so platforms, because platforms can then multiply and leverage them very strongly. So that, that's the exit valuation. Um, this sounds a very MBA-ish question, mm. but who's got an MBA, I, I MBA don't have on an the panel? <laughs> I don't we have an accountant. Let's try it, with the accountant. It's not, it's not going to be an MBA answer, but the, fir the first thing on platform business models, if, if you haven't read it, there's a fantastic book called The Platform Revolution, mm. which you should definitely read if you're trying to set up a platform business. Uh, I think the theory is right that platform businesses should be valued more highly. Um, because you've 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 got you've got two two sets of you've got two parties. Uh, the the platform obviously is between two different parties. So, you know, eBay is an obvious platform business model, or Airbnb is an obvious biz platform business model, and and we're going to see more and more platform business mod models here in operation um, throughout the world. So I think the theory's right, but how you how you are 
how you'd apply that in academic terms is quite different. Anybody else want to answer that? No, I don't. I, mean, I can't really add much into that, but if you're looking at platforms, you probably want to start looking at companies like VCs like Notion Capital, who've got huge experience in platform technologies, platform SaaS technologies. We tend to work in so software, so we will have platform elements of it, but go, go to an expert that's sort of going to guide you through that phase. We didn't answer your cost point, though. No. Um, fixed costs. I mean, generally, you know, the great, the great thing about today's internet age is that you don't have to have huge fixed costs. So the barriers to entry to starting a business have come down. Mm -hmm. So you know, you go out and rent server space from AWS or Microsoft, you go to Azure or whoever it is. You don't need loads of, to buy loads of expensive servers for 20 grand each. So most of my businesses don't have any fixed costs. The biggest cost is the people. Mm -hmm. By far, by far. Um, OK, you can have your <laughs> say, good, but again, don't make it too specific. And then we've got a chap here and a, a, a woman there, yeah. It's not specific, it's very general. Um, uh, so, sorry, Samson Rogers, co-founder of Cellular Highways, my co-founders here. Ah, um, now you reveal it. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, now I'm expecting in all cases, uh, most, most of your investments are going to need larger investors to build value. Now when the time comes for that, they're, raise, they're trying to raise money from the next level up. Uh, what are your concerns about that and how do you, uh, how do you try to protect your, uh, your position or work with those larger investors? Well, I'll just start with that because what we fear, and we'll see what Kerry says about this, as angels that we, larger capital comes in with some sort of preference share structure. And so that's fine if everything works all the way up. But if there's some sort of hiccup in that journey, the preference shares will affect, could squash us. And there's a great example, and I don't think he's in the room, here in Cambridge of a, a big exit. It's a nine digit exit where the founders ended up with nothing. The preference stack, so I think there were e, up to E preference shares worked out that it could, so, you know, this is pretty dangerous for angels because of the press. So a capital, capital light business, if there's such a thing, is something that we would rather invest in. So we wouldn't touch, though I, I say this, I've got the exception to this, a drug discovery company. I actually invested in a drug discovery company but <laughs> because of the capital requirements there. Kerry, do you want to answer that first? Or do you want to answer that last? Or maybe you don't want to answer it at all? I mean, it's relevant. I have to answer it. So how do you protect, protect your position? So I think that pref question is really relevant. And that's probably why you call us a friendly VC, is because we tend to work alongside and support you. But often we come into companies so there is some form of pref structure, and we will have to come in and, and abide by that. We used to have a preference structure that fell away after certain targets are met, like an IRR of 25% and things like that. And they revert back to ordinary shares. There are mechanisms that you can use and all of these things. But this comes down to your investor again you know why do they want that you know is it because your valuation is too high w what are you doing here you know why are we at this position with press at the moment um, so I'd probably start with that as a, as a question. Yeah. Anybody else want to add? If you start as an angel at the early stage you you cannot keep investing forever because you're gonna run out of money so you've got to accept that at some point you're gonna hand the baton on to a venture capitalist, preferably, or maybe some other form of, you know, maybe it's a, a, a family office, maybe it's some form of strategic investor. Um, or, or venture debt. You know, a business I'm on the board of is raising five million of venture debt at the moment, which is effectively debt, but with a high interest rate and a kicker of some form. Sorry. Uh, or, or, or actually, there's this subject, you know, which we call replacement capital. So some venture capitalists are saying, actually, we'll set up a one, set up a secondary fund to buy out angels at a point in time. Um, when they do quite a significant round. But generally, venture capitalists don't want to do that because they want their capital to work as primary finance directly into the company because they want to pour petrol in the tank. And the growth metrics that you've sold them as an entrepreneur, they, they, their eyes light up and they go, yes, we want to pour pet petrol in and we want, we, we want to fire those, all those cylinders. So they're not that keen to put money to work in secondary. But I, I've just been involved in, in, in a company where uh, when I'm on the board and the VC has invested new money and they've also taken out some of the original shareholders in a secondary. So they've done both. And some people, some uh, angels like me have invested alongside the VC. So there's but been some took the money and left. Some took the money and left. Some of the early investors, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. yeah th uh, I, as a, a, a sort of newer investor than some of my colleagues, certainly in Cambridge Angels, um, I get the advice of other people and there's one that 
uh, one of the Tims helped me with um, the, the, the preference share versus do you get the tax free for the preference? I listen to more knowledgeable people than me, but you know you're going to get diluted. It's, it's, it's the game of when you get out, which is quite interesting to me because uh, you know, people want to clean up the term sheet, as it were, and get rid of the angels, is what I've heard. I don't know, not always, yeah. obviously. Well, so, sometimes the share cap table can be very long. So in this particular case I was talking about, it was a long shareholder list, and we were very keen to clean the shareholder list up, consolidate it, make it more manageable. Because the problem with long shareholder lists is somebody's got to manage it. Yeah. So, um, and in this particular case, it's me, actually, who's got responsibility for 40% of the share cap table, more than the incoming VC, who, who now owns about 25%. The 40% so, distributed over... Over yeah. about four different angel groups. Yeah. Groups, yeah. Groups. Probably. Four different groups. 30 angels, yeah. Can we move on to this chap here and then the lady there, wasn't it? You wanted next and then one guy at the back. Hello, I'm Warren Bath. I work for an engineering company in Cambridge. I wondered your perspective. I know you're uh, focused on B2B mainly, but equity crowdfunding. As an investor, would you avoid a company that's done a round of equity crowdfunding because of the complications? Well, I'll start that because I'm... Uh, have anybody heard of Syndicate Room? Uh, Gonzalo and uh, both of them actually, Tom did MBAs here about seven years ago and Gonzalo actually approached me at a, an Ignite event which is one of the programmes here and uh, I invested in the two family and friends rounds and I've invested in five of the rounds since then. City Room is somewhat different from Crowdcube and Cedars which are the other two big ones. Um, yes, the answer to question honestly is if they've, you've had a crowd cube round specifically and maybe a cedars round the chances are that the valuation is still acceptable to angels is not very high and what's happening then is that the because effectively the, on a crowdfunding platform you as the entrepreneur are setting the terms and raising it obviously the crowdfunding platform doesn't want it too high because they want the deal to close because they don't get the commission otherwise but you can get situations i mean an example which is in the public domain is sugru I don't know if you've heard that. It's a special sort of stuff for making, sticking on, I don't know, shoes together and things. It's, it's like a glue, but not quite. It was 33 million post money valuation on the last Crowdcube round, and it was an 8 million sale. So it was a 4x down round on the sale. Now, there's probably something else to that, but there is the danger that once it's gone through crowdfunding, that there'll be a reset when you get other money in, particularly VC money, in fact. So... Anybody else want to add to that? Do you want to go first? Or what? I'll take it. Um, for me, we don't tend to see many businesses that have gone through the uh, crowd cube, but there is a place for it. And at the end of the day, it's your business. And if, you, if that's what you want to do, you probably see some more successful ones on the B2C side that have done yep. that successfully. Um, but we don't tend to see it because we're engaging with guys at, at, at this level. Um, so no, I don't. And, and if I'm being brutally honest, have I invested in something that has had a crowdfunding element and I've crushed it? No, I haven't. I but haven't VCs any, do. I haven't done any investments. No. I've had ones that have gone alongside and maybe got later investment, but never one that's had it before no. angels. No. Yeah. And yeah, I think the, there is a place for crowdfunding platforms. Syndicate Room, as Peter said, is slightly different from, from the major vanilla players. The, these platforms tend to pass the power to the company for the pricing. Um, and what happens is that pricing is generally too high, and then when you go on to follow-on rounds, you can't raise follow-on rounds because you've raised the money at too high a level in the first place. Good. Another question here? Hi, I'm Juliet, and I co-founded an educational nonprofit. but my question is not about the nonprofit. Uh, actually, it's relevant to the ask, like, if you have investment, so how much equity sh should you give away? Like, what's the logic behind calculating the equity, the shares? And also, um, if the company has a very healthy, positive cash flow, is it still good, a good idea to have external investment? So I'll, I'll just start that. In the old days, it used to be giving away 30% and 30%. So 30% gives you 70%. Another 30% takes you down to 49%. So it means you've effectively in terms of percentage, you own about half the company. That has changed, and so you actually, generally, you will give away less percentage of the company. But it comes back to what Kerry said, you've got to raise enough money to run, in fact, she mentioned 12 months, I believe 18 months, mm. 
because 18 months gives you enough time. If you raise for too short a time, then you'll be going out fundraising far too soon. You've got to raise enough money to get to the point where there's a value inflection, i.e. the value has gone up. So the next time you've got a high valuation and you sell less of your company but for more money, effectively. <coughs> so um, so that, that's... I agree. Yeah. I agree. And I was yeah. saying in the olden days that you do see 12 months just to optimise that flavour, but you're seeing them coming out raising much more now, which is why, as a consequence, we had to raise our, uh, our size of our funds to answer Jeremy's question there. So my answer to your question would be, if you've got a healthy cash flow, it comes back to the two points we were, uh, we've discussed at, at length tonight, which is why do you need an investor alongside her? What, what, what are we going to do to unlock and make your growth faster or more efficient? And secondly, do you want to scale? And there are very few examples of companies that have efficiently scaled just themselves. There, there are, there are, but they're very few. So if you suddenly need to scale, you've got to get that high caliber team underneath you. You've got to make sure, you, there's so much investment to do, but you have to make sure that you are ready for that. So that would be my answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just, yeah. I, was only, I was only going to say that it, um, Peter's book, which he mentioned at yeah. the beginning and hasn't, we haven't mentioned since, The Invested Investor, is really good on, on your question about the numbers, what percentage mm. you need to give away, and some of the stories around that. Absolutely. Um, that, that book's an excellent read. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that if you're, if you're an entrepreneur or you're an investor and you're new to the game, then that is a great book to read uh, for, in a UK context of some of the stories that I find personally often these stories bring bring these things to life much more than just a, a lecture. Absolutely, and it transitions into the VC beautifully. It's really accurate. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, how Thank about you. that? <laughs> 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 Thanks to Kate, who wrote yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so, yes, a chap at the back there. He's back. Um, I'm wondering, how do you become a VC or an angel at the first place? Thank you. Yeah, so by accident. There are two different <laughs> answers to that, aren't there? So let's start. I think you've sort of heard that to some extent. Well, let's try. Simon hasn't really described how he went from a corporate life in this sort of similar field to Angel. In fact, I'm not even sure I know that. Uh, okay, well, there's two parts to that question, um, or two, two answers to that. Uh, firstly, I mean, I had actually, uh, I was involved in equity research for most of my career. So I was involved in researching companies. And I always liked equities because equities was distinct from bonds require a management team and it's the management team that makes it interesting and makes it more of a, a partly an art as well as a science and so there's always been management teams and the personnel that really interested me and when I when I left equity research to set up my own business I had a specific idea uh, which I wanted to develop myself and because I had actually come from an entrepreneurial background back in my youth because both my parents were entrepreneurs they did they ran their own business and when I was 16 I was going to antique auctions buying antiques and reselling them and made quite quite a nice little business out of it. So I had that sort of in my blood. But I had this idea in 2009, and I very quickly found a company that was doing it far better than I was ever going to do. And I thought, well, I'd better invest in them. So that's how I started. Um, and that company was SwiftKey. Wow. So. Uh, yeah. um, do you want to add anything? Pam, or should we move to? Uh, no, I think I've told you my story. It was, um, um, I was making, actually I was making a very high value introduction and a friend of mine who's a serious entrepreneur, made a lot of money, said get some equity, get some equity. I didn't even know what he meant really, so I can't have some equity. Um, and, and it started from there, but then it's the thrill, it's the thrill of it, it's really fun. Um, you do have to have money, I mean I earn money as a management advisor to fund my angel habit. Quite a lot of angels don't need, they have big piles of cash so I'm sorry to burst your bubble out there I don't have big piles of cash yeah so uh, before we move on to <laughs> Kerry who will give the sort of VC viewpoint 70% of the Cambridge Angels so there are 60 of us have had including me though my exit wasn't very big have had te technology exits and then this pile of cash you're talking about is probably low millions and up to 500 million the average, this sort of figure that people talk about in our industry is to allocate on your asset allocation once you've got spare wealth, no more than 15%, probably 10% of that to angel investing. Because you've got to bear in mind, there is a pretty good chance, unless you get it right, you will lose some or all of that. So you really, I, I, I don't know how, who's done angel investing in the audience? Yeah, it must be Pete. Anybody? Are you going to put your hand up for Hugh? Yeah, he's done a bit. 
that's about it really. But just but just a, a little thing that um, I one of my jobs is trying to get more women to be angel investors and Simon found me and he's really really good at promoting women and um, if you go to your standard financial advisor they go cold and white and have to sit down when you say you're an angel investor they go oh god you know, pass me the smelling salts because they see it as so risky but if you've got other sources of income and reliable sort of source of income uh, even if you're not worth 500 million you have it's just a proportion of your wealth that you do this with. so we're going to kerry's going to finish this and describe it from a professional viewpoint mm -hmm. and then we're going to stop the questions going to finish at eight and i want to one or two comments from the from everybody from the three panelists and i'll probably add my own as well okay so kerry give, give us the super, vc viewpoint super brief on how to become a vc in the first place um it's a team so just like you guys are compiling your founders alongside you a vc is compiling its founders alongside us so our team we have max awesome deal maker you know he takes those really fast growing scaling companies right through to exit Ed, on the other hand, is like deeply technical, but not just technical. He really understands where the market is moving. And myself, I look at products, I look at team, and we, and we work so harmoniously together. It is, it, it is like a founding team. It's very entrepreneurial. Most people have come from a tech background, MBA, all of that sort of route. If you see the typical venture capitalists, investment banks, that sort of thing. I come from a completely separate um, line. I was on the more entrepreneurial side. So back in the early 90s, I was setting up internet trading floor in Italy, because that was just too far a complex. Uh, a problem for the Italians to understand you could trade something without physically meeting and, and, and touching hand at the time. Um, the internet was just coming through, you know, it was awesome in those days. But what makes, you know, what you have to have if you want to be a VC is you have to love people. We are blessed. I have the best job in the world because of you guys and your awesome ideas and we're working with such energy, really. And when it goes well, it's just a great, 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 it's just it's such a great feeling for you guys when you exit your businesses and uh, it's, it's good. So that's about it. Good. And in fact, if you look at the guy to your right there with a blue shirt, blue top on, uh, Tom, who <laughs> looking uh, embarrassing him here, has worked. He, he, he approached me seven years ago and he's worked himself up into a position where he knows sh huge amounts about our industry. He's worked for Simon, he's worked for Cambridge Enterprise, he's worked for Struan, the other angel group in Cambridge. And now he, he effectively runs uh, on an operational basis the venture fund from the Marshall family here in Cambridge called Martlett. So have a chat with him over drinks. Right, I'm going to, I think we've got about four or five minutes left. Are, are you going to finish off and close or not, Matt? <coughs> yeah, at the end. So let's just have a minute or so each from each of you. Have you got your thoughts in uh, Simon's thinking carefully? Simon first then. Just one thing to say about entrepreneurs. I mean, just, just in terms of to what it is to be entrepreneurial. I think we haven't really talked about that a lot tonight, but entrepreneurs are kind of outliers. Um, they're not they're not right down the middle. They're not really normal people. They are going to be outliers in some dimension. And I'm looking for people who've got unreasonable optimism. I'm looking for people that wear the can-do badge. You know, they, these are going to be pretty special people. They're hugely motivated. And when I meet them, I'm, I'm going to see there's a spark in their eye of something really, really interesting. That's, that's really important to me as an investor. Pam? Um, you made me uh, think something, Peter, that we're too nice sometimes. So uh, I would ask for people's honest opinion. We don't do that enough. And uh, Americans, are, I think, are better at saying, nah. Uh, so ask for, uh, ask for a, a proper opinion when you've seen people. Um, and, uh, and, and keep bugging us. I forget to get back to people who, are, who I don't know, I have to say. So just keep bugging us in a nice way. And the final thing is, um, is back to the research. I'm very passionate about healthcare. I'm a massive supporter of the NHS, what everybody says, anyone says. So you, know, you have to sort of connect your passion to the, to the financier. It's easy in health, because health is very deeply emotional, but find that sort of passion link. Kerry, last word? Or two? For me, it's immerse yourself, as I said, and I'm repeating myself again, but it's immerse yourself. Take advantage of everything that Judge has to offer you and all of the fantastic events in Cambridge area. Talk to founders who, in the, in the process of funding, through the process of funding, and, and all of these different elements, everybody will talk to you. OK. Mm. And just finally, the... Uh, mentioned by Pam. Pam's pretty direct. She's probably even more direct than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Simon's actually pretty nice and really... <laughs> really that. Oh, this, this book is about openness, honesty and transparency. Again, this was covered before. So 
the entrepreneurs must listen, but they must also be honest, because in the end, it's a trust relationship between us and you. You, we haven't talked about it very much, but you must check on us as much as possible. We can misbehave. You've got to do mm. reference checking on us. More difficult it is us doing on you, except we have, it, you know, we have a portfolio you can approach. But in the end, if you can keep a close, honest relationship with yeah. your investors, you're much more likely to have a good journey. Yeah, yeah well said. So and at that point, mm -hmm. I get the final word, being chair, mm. so Matt will close it down now. Please join me in a round of applause.